Uh, hello everyone. Um, re recording watchers and uh, and uh, people who are watching live alike. I think there may be uh, quite some recording watchers this time because uh, the British uh, Online Congress is going on and I think a lot of people are playing. I think three of my own students are playing, actually. So, hello world, yes, hello go often. Or go, go often, somehow. Um, so... Today's lecture is a little bit of a of a bounce off um, of a tangent on on the last lecture I made, which to it, in it in itself was a little bit of um of an extension of a lecture that Matthias did already a month and a half ago, or no, I guess a month ago. Math, yes, yes, a month ago, and uh, Matthias did a lecture on uncertainty at the time, and. Um, and that's actually very, very closely related to playing games where there's a big imbalance in who's better and who's not. Because when someone's leading by a lot, they want the game to end quickly. And a lot of certainty to be on the board, and we know what's going to happen. And Whereas the player who's losing really wants the board to be as uncertain as possible, and for unexpected things to happen, and for the game to be very, very long. And, uh, you know, that's why uh, last lecture, I went offer the approach of winning lost games where you're just your position is terrible and you somehow get the game back which is actually looking back on my tournament history a little bit of a specialty of mine um i passed on going to a restaurant and instead bought um konbini food so i can follow the lecture i wish i knew what konbini was but um yeah that's that's kind of you i'm glad you're here that's uh that's auntie so and um, auntie's you know um and Auntie's kibitzing of the lectures is always quite nice. Convenience store, I see. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I was t I was in Tokyo maybe two years ago. And yeah, that was... No, three years ago. Wow, I'm getting old. Um, Yeah, three years ago. And the convenience stores were like everywhere, yeah. Um, So, yeah. Th that's the topic of the lecture, more or less. And uh, this time... I'm looking at the the same types of uh, positions, but from the opposite perspective. So last lecture, we were looking at, you know, some positions where I was incredibly, terribly lost, and I won anyway, which is, they're actually very common. I have lots of examples, and, you know, we looked over those in the lecture. And in that lecture, we looked at, and th that lecture is available on YouTube if anyone's interested, also on the Nordic Otoja uh, channel. It, it, the topic... You know, it's all about finding how to make your opponent worry, how to find uncertainty on the board, and how to, you know, make the position unclear. Even if it's not necessarily good for you, the more unclear the board is, the more likely it is that things will fall in your favor. Uh, and that's good when you're behind, let's say. And in this lecture, we're going to be talking about very similar games, but from the opposite perspective. You're the person who's trying to win a one game, and you're going to try to prevent all these things from happening. And uh, interestingly, you know, it. I, I would say that I'm nearly as good at losing won games than I am at uh, winning lost ones. So I have a lot of examples of me going wrong in this one. Conver you know, conversely to last lecture where I, some of my most outrageous wins are, are immortalized. So yeah, this... Um, I guess we might as well just jump straight into the examples then. So... This game is against, um, okay, so, you know, last, last lecture, I did, uh, I, I had a game lined up, which some of you may know about, which is my game against, uh, Benjamin, Benjamin Drian Guinezia, or as some people like to know him, Ben Zero, from, uh, the 20, like, the Grand Prix Finale that was played a month ago, where I had, like, one of the most lost positions ever and won, but actually... We're going to go back in time a year ago, like a year before this, uh, to the 2019 Grand Prix Finale, uh, which was one of the last in-person tournaments I played. And in this game, I had a very one position, which kind of crumbled. So, you know, one could say that we actually traded blows in the Grand Prix Finale. Interestingly, this game was also decisive. Like, whoever wins the game gets out of the group into the quarterfinals, whoever loses the game doesn't. 
So Ben, you know, Ben Zero and I traded, uh, traded absolutely losing games, um, like year after year in the Grand Prix finale. So, yeah. Um, I mean, the game itself, I'll run through it for context. Um, I was, you know, I, I played for Moyo because that's what I did back then. I still do it now, but less. And we got into this kind of crazy fight. Uh, I cut through. I'm not sure I would have done that now. Um, this game was a little bit over a year ago. And yeah, very suspicious play. I think he could have captured my group in the middle, but he missed how to do it. And in the end, I got a good position. Then all the groups started dying. All of the groups started dying. Um, top left is one of those barely alive ones, huh? Uh, yeah, yeah. So you'll see that almost every, like in this game, around four different groups started dying. And all of them started, and all of them ended up living though. So yeah. So, but I, I, I was, I was black though. So, so yeah. Shows up recently in your games. Yeah, yeah. But this game, this game started as a Moyo game. I had the right intention. Oh, Siku raiding with a party of four. Hey, S Siku, Siku is one of the Nordic Odocho students who was playing in the British uh, online Go Congress, right? How did your game go? I'm, yeah. Yeah, did you win? It's a good question. Yeah, but anyway, running through the game quickly for context. We're not... Uh, okay. So, this is maybe the point that I wanted to get to. Siku is 4-0. Damn, that's pretty good. Nice. Oh, hello, Worf Worfus. Um, yeah, it's... Nice, yeah, congrats. So, this is the point I wanted to get to. So... The point in this fight is that I kind of got, you know, I'm, I'm, I think, I thought I was doing very well at this point in the game, but the first job that we have in this lecture isn't to start playing from the assumption that we're better, we need to figure out if we're better. So the first thing we're going to do is analyze who's better and what's going on, and then we're going to figure out um, what to do. And the reason that this is an important step is that how many games have you played in your life where you were theoretically better, like where you thought you were better and then you check the computer and you weren't better? Or you just, like, you thought you had a good position and then eventually you realize you didn't, you consulted a stronger player, you didn't, or your opponent disagreed with you. So I think it's important to figure out whether you have a good position or not. I, I thought I did, but we want to make sure. And the, the next thing after we make sure is we need to figure out what I need to do here to keep the position clear. Um, oh, hello there, go Dave. Teach me how to beat Cow. A Cow's another NGD student, for those of you who don't know. Um, yeah, I, he's uh, he's been doing well recently, actually. He's I, I saw him be, play yesterday some tournament game and win some training game. Nice game. Okay, so... It, I, I'd say that this game, and I don't know what chat thinks, to me it's pretty clearly apparent that black is better on points. Oh, hello there, Chris. Um, Chris uh, F01. Also an NGD student, I think. Um, so, I think it becomes clear rather quickly that black's better on points. Because if, if we look at how many points white has, it's not many. So let's consider you have, uh, I mean, the end game. The end game later will look something like this. So white has about, you know, seven points and on the top left and about three points on the on the on the left side. I mean, after I play this kind of sequence, white's not even alive with the entire dragon. So white, you know, like it's technically in a little bit of trouble. Uh, if I, I seem to remember, I seem to remember that during the game, I was reading that White could make some eye with some exchanges around here, so maybe the group isn't in any trouble, but that's I'm not sure anymore. That was my reading. So The last session with Jeff instantly gave me two stones. Nice. Yeah, that was... What did he say? As, yeah, asking for a friend, actually. Yeah. Um, yeah, Jeff's pretty good. And... TLDR, don't leave stupid cuts. Protect your cutting points. Yeah, that's often good. Um, so, 
I was figuring that the position position is pretty good for me because if if we tally up all of White's points, including Komi, it barely adds up to twenty five. You know, which you know, I, I and I have more than that. So, next advice: don't always protect your cutting point. Yeah, that's the next step. Learn which cutting points to protect. Um, I have a student who's about EGF nine Q or so. And uh, it's a lot about, yeah, keep your group safe and keep your cutting points in order, let's say. And yeah, that, and then later you can figure out which cutting points you actually want to leave. Okay, so I think that in this position, Black has about, you know, 20 solid points. But consider that I have this Ponuki, correct? And... I can actually, if I remember correctly, I can kill white in the center with one move. I think I can. Ah, uh, 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 wait, white wedge is here. But I play here then, so that's not actually a problem. So I could kill white in the center, and then I just have a point lead. And I also have, you know, even though the, the game is kind of even on points, I have this corner which will kind of get me some cash. Now, the question I have for the audience is... What is what is Black scared of here? What are the sources of uncertainty? Like, what are you worried might happen to you? And I was pretty clear on what could happen to me this game. Um, maybe I was a little bit too scared in retrospect, but you know, in the game, in the game, in the beginning, I did a very good job of reducing uncertainty and just getting a better position. And then I stopped doing a good job, so I lost. So, yeah. Mm. So what I was worried about, L9 can escape and counterattack. Yeah, that, that's definitely one thing. So if, if white gets to escape in one move, then I have several problems. So I have this group, this group isn't alive. Doesn't even have a full eye. Okay, I can make one here. Like, B is sente. This group isn't fully alive. And this group, if I remember correctly, the status of this group is that I can I can live locally except if white starts taking this eye and goes crazy, which I wanted to avoid. So I have lots of problems suddenly, A, B, and C, which I had to take care of. And I seem to remember that if I were to, you know, I was concerned that if I start by killing the stones, that white would get a little bit too much, um, too much in terms of center moves uh, towards the top left. So this move should. But I think I was too scared, actually. Can this group ever die? The top left group. It has an eye locally. I at the time I remember that maybe I was. I was winning too too much, because look at what I did in the game. I connected, then I connected again, I let white kill me in the center, I defended r13, and and I let white play h17, then I played here and I'm like, I'm better on point. And I'm right. I'm, I'm right, too. That's the funny thing. So, looking back on this, I was even too cautious, because I don't... I don't really see the issue with just killing the stones in the middle, which which I seriously consider. Hmm. The the only major concern would be, well, let's imagine that white gets. You know, here I will kill. And. Assume white sacrifices it directly. It's a little bit too small. So just the right side's bigger. Yeah, maybe the right side's bigger in terms of points, but then if you if you let white play it, then all of black's groups are hanging, to put it in chess terms. So, g15 and sente. I mean, yeah, I, I did play g15, or like, I, I actually jumped h15. So, okay, I guess in retrospect, I'm overvaluing the stones, because this move is sente. And what I did here, the nice thing is that I'm better, so what I did was very, very clear. Two Cautious has probably lost me more games in the endgame than the opposite, says Godev. Yeah, and actually, being too cautious while ahead, 
um, being too cautious while ahead is one of the parts of this lecture that we're going to talk about. So I have, I have games later on where you're being too cautious and you lose because you can increase certainty to try and keep your lead. But if you decrease your lead to increase certainty, that's a problem, potentially. H15 for black looks big. So okay, maybe in the game I just didn't value the stones highly enough. In any case, what I did was great when you're ahead because my two weak groups are like all nicely connected, suddenly. And white technically can cut them, but it's getting kind of difficult for white to do so. And actually, um, white has to watch out for his own group because... I mean, I, I, can, I can snag an eye at c9 in Sente, and then the plan was to force white to live with two eyes in the center. I, I seem to remember some crazy reading where this move or something made an eye, but I, I'd have to read it carefully. So in any case, what happened was I defended everything. I played k18. I'm like, I'm winning. And I am winning. I'm winning by about Comey or so. Uh, the computer agrees. And I, I would check again quickly because, again, if you're playing with the mindset that you're winning, but you keep making concessions, you might not be winning anymore. So, you know, my counting at the time was that if, if, if I were to keep, let's say, this ring of points, I'm fine. Of course, I'd keep the corner, right? So with that in mind, what is Black scared of now? Because we enter another stage of the game. I save the groups. I'm slightly better. You know, call me better. Um, if this just goes into an endgame, I'm exceedingly likely to win because the endgame is very straightforward. So endgame is like, I, I'll get this in Sente, and, you know, white will either be forced to make an ice somewhere in this center or here. One of the two ways. Actually, not clear which way or if it's possible. I, I have some vague recollection of reading this. But, okay, let's believe that white can make an eye. Whether white can make an eye is not our problem, it's white's problem. So, we're going to play this endgame in Sente. And then we're just going to close the top right, and there's no endgame left, because we've been fighting all game, there's nothing left to do. So a Komi lead is actually pretty safe. What is black worried about? I ask the audience. What is the... What could go wrong here? What could possibly go wrong in this board situation? Because to me, it's already one very, very specific thing that is not quite settled yet. And, you know, this is not a big worry, but it's enough of a worry that I need to consider it. Uh, and it's actually what lost me the game here. Uh, Co in the corner. Top, yeah, top right corner. Exactly, exactly. Some people are picking up on this. White plays R17. You know, if white played it now, I can hardly avoid a Co. Yeah, I can hardly avoid a ko. I mean, I'm, I wouldn't even play the ko because it's too heavy for black. Like, uh, this type of ko... If black wins it, you just keep the corner you already have. If white wins it, then suddenly the, the top right becomes, like, black's weak there, suddenly. So, this type of ko. Now, the reason white isn't activating this quite yet is that is kind of twofold. So first of all, if if we play uh, J J17 here, for example, white's dying on the top side. And this corner is big, but it's not that big. So white has to be careful. I'm keeping white a little bit busy while playing endgame so that white doesn't um, do this yet, but I'm worried about it, right? So th this is something I, I have to... And I remember very consciously thinking during the game, I want to figure out if I can prevent R17. And uh, so for the moment... For the moment, white does nothing. Now, if white started this now, I th my intention at this point was to try and kill. And the way I intended to try and kill was by using this uh, center IG a little bit. So, oh yeah, yeah, okay. I remember, I remember my, in oh, oh, my intentions were so evil. Oh, my intentions are incredibly evil. Um, oh, hello there, Al Al Alved Guz. Um, so, so my intentions were, okay, let's play this, this, um, this, this, and, oh, well, uh, I should probably exchange these first. So, the whole plan was to get this move in. And this is threatening, what this is threatening is that now we, we're going to kill white this way. Because the whole issue 
with this type of, of shape is that white can sometimes get out. But here, white just has limited, limited space. So S15 not working to kill. S15, I, there was a problem with S15 if I remember correctly. S S15 does sometimes work. So yes, it's, it's a type of move you should consider when you're thinking of killing. Um, yeah, maybe if Black gets some extra stones, it works too. But, you know, I, I didn't need to find multiple ways. Also, keep in mind we're sort of under time pressure at this point. Um, I don't need multiple ways to kill. I need one. So, I, you know, maybe this one works. I just thought of the other one. If that, you know. Um, I, I think if I were concerned about anything regarding this move, it would be this attachment. Yeah, it's something like 018, yeah. So if I were if I was concerned about something, it would be this. So uh, the idea being that if black Oh, this is actually quite annoying because if we try to hane white cross cuts and then there's so much aji here. It's really unpleasant. Um So white's should white push first? If if this white's already out, but of course black will extend. But if black extends, then eventually we're just gonna get a lot of center moves. So this type of thing can be worrying. What I liked about this sequence potentially was that usually when black plays here, white has like one way to fight. White can just push through and try to cut at R15 and try to do something. So it's like very linear what white can do. If white can't do that, white's dead. So that's maybe why I liked what I wanted to do in the game. Now, if white lives, then uh, my, yeah, so the idea was that I get to here. Um, limiting white's moves, yeah. Um, wait, which way do I get at? I mean, this one's a ko, but this one's also a bit riskier. Like, it's not a co, but it would, be, like, it locally get us white. It's a net, but this one's better, I think. So the idea was to get in something like this, and then start attacking white on the other side. So something like this, white's probably just dying. So, so the plan was to scare white into letting me kill him. And, and white agreed. So white agreed and played a Q13. Um, and... This is one of the most, like, this is a very, like, maybe seemingly innocent mistake, but I really got in trouble here because of it. Uh, which move would you play now? So with everything that we've discussed, so obviously white was scared about the Aji around A, so white played an exchange to kind of help that. And now black has one job. If white doesn't live on the top right, I mean, I could theoretically lose this end game, but it's really hard. It, you know, black's just b much better at the moment. So, what is the best move that black can answer with to keep your corner safe? Which is maybe not the same move as which is the best move. There's two different moves black could consider here, I think. Maybe just R15. Yeah, R15... r is probably the move I should have played. Yeah, so it seemed people agreed. So the game story is what goes wrong with black Q14? No. So Q14, Q14 is arguably the correct move. Because if white can't live anyway, then you're getting more points, right? Um, I mean, of course, you're giving it... It's a little bit weird in terms of endgame, so... Potentially, this is the right move anyway. But this is the safest. R15 is just the safest. White's never, ever, ever living in here. So... I not play R15 during the game, but but easy to say afterwards. Well, I so R15, I'm annoyed in retrospect that I didn't see this move. Like, it didn't really occur to me. The move I thought would keep my corner safe was R14. And R14 looks good as well. Like, it looks hard to live in here. But then you need to see what happened to me in the game. Um, so this small detail, you know, it's it's a little bit of a small detail, but honestly, it's obvious that R15 protects Black's corner more than R14 ever could. You know, this is like, this is like, does Black want White to make this exchange for him? Of course he does. 
the center is very small, white cannot really make anything there because there's A, there's B, black can enter it multiple ways, it's not a big deal. What black wants is to have this corner be safe. Because at this point, the end game, the game, end game is so small, the board is so complete that the only thing that could go wrong is this corner. So this was a very easy situation where black can compromise a little bit and get a good result. I might see it during the game because of the double knight 4-4 four, four enclosure scares me. Yeah, there's always actually in the double 4-4 um, four, four enclosure. Um, so, like the double like knight. So, I mean, this isn't... I mean, this is a transposed double knight, I suppose. So, okay. White obviously invaded. And here I was having a hard time figuring out how to answer. Uh, and in fact, I actually blundered and let white live. So... Um, you know, white shouldn't live, white should get a co at most. And I'm wondering which types of moves I should consider here in retrospect. The problem with the Han is the crosscut, after which white's gonna get out somehow. That's, that's the thing. This shape should get a name. Um, black's correct shape. What is the correct move here for black? I, I don't, like, I, I, I've seen a lot of, um, doesn't R15 still kill? R15 bump both sides. You mean this? Yeah, I, I've seen this in some AlphaGo games. I've seen this in some AlphaGo games, but I remember having a problem with it in this situation. So usually I would do this. So the longbow. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I, I remember that there was something I didn't like about this. Um, I mean, it's already bad I got myself into this situation. Like, let's say that white, you know, I played A, white played B. Black would play C. Black wouldn't play here, you know? The shape is super thin and white gets, like, everything they want on the outside if you force a kill, I think. Um, well, in this case, this type of situation is a little bit worrying already. And, you know, black can kill this locally. Black can kill this locally. I'm just thinking, if we're spending a move to kill locally, then what's happening to our group? I, I guess the better move, the better move is probably here because we get eyes with one of the groups and then, with, I, which is the better way to kill? I guess this should be okay for black. So, yeah. Hmm, so maybe I could have tried this move. I, I think if I had to guess, if I had to guess 2-2. Two, two, yeah, 2-2 two, two might be the best way to kill. If I had to guess, I was scared of this move. Because I've been thinking about it now, and this move's pretty scary. Um, so us usually this move wouldn't be scary, but it is because of some out stuff on the outside here. Um, or that's... That's my guess as to what scared me. Like, I played a different move and uh, misread a basic Sumego, which it wasn't better than this, for sure. Um, so the idea of this move is that if black plays Q17, this Hane should be a little bit annoying. So what white's trying to do is get a liberty race against the other three stones. And, you know, if black plays this, obviously white Atari's out. So this kind of move, I think, is worrying for black. And if you play this way, then white's getting a little bit too much space in the, in the corner. So I remember being worried... I, like, I remember being worried about 018 at multiple different points in this invasion sequence. So I... like the... O, well, not 02, the 018 Aji. And I think that it may have been this. So, but what I tried in the game was much worse. So, you know, I have to say that. So I played Q17. And in my defense, I was under some time pressure. But I actually just misread a basic Sumego here. Very basic Sumego. So, yeah, white played, white played S8, S17, which I, I missed, even though I shouldn't miss it. So, I mean, what I probably should do here is allow the code to happen. And... This co is still relatively reasonable for black, so 
you know, I'm gonna use, I'm gonna probably just play in the center and try to keep white's group weak. And I have some Koaji to start at Q19 later. And this game is probably playable for black, but now once white gets some, you know, some space in the corner, black's not clearly better anymore. So white did a good job of stirring up some trouble in the corner and finding a living, well, a living sequence. Um, in the game, I just blundered directly and let white live. And after this, I'm the, the game's just terrible for me. So, yeah, the game ended pretty abruptly, which was my fault, I suppose. And uh, the game basically collapsed in only a few moves, because if I were to play here, I think black's just clearly better in an endgame where not that much is happening. So black's just going to win, very probably. Um, now, yeah. So from the perspective of of uncertainty and just finding peaceful ways or reasonable ways to reduce how much trouble can happen on the board, just h15, connect all your stones, make territory, and then play r15 would have been a very good way to play. And <laughs> I thought this lecture was about winning one games, not losing them. Well. I want to discuss some mistakes that people have made, and then I actually have a result. Like, I have a game played by someone where they did a great job of winning a one game. Um, and that's that's going to be the, the, end, the end game for the lecture, so... Okay. Oscar adjusted it when I joined the stream. <laughs> Oof. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, okay. This one... Yeah, this game actually was one of the more important games I had played at the time. Um, I, a lot of the games that I've lost uh, in very important matches were games where I had huge advantages at some point. Um, not over, over, but pretty over kind of positions. Um, and I have another one of them very soon, so... Okay. Uh, this one... I, I think I did well until I didn't play R15. R15 would have been a good way to, to finish things. Okay. Um, next example. Um, next example was, oh, oh no, oh, this game, this is probably the most important game I've lost in my life, I think so. Like, in terms of tournament play. Yeah, I think so. So, so this game, this game was, I, I played it in 2019 in the Grand Slam, um, the qualifying round for the Grand Slam. I get Lucas Potpera. So if I would win, I'd get into the quarterfinals of the Grand Slam, which would have been pretty neat. Um, okay. So the game was a crazy fighting game, which was good for me. Um, um, I cut I cut F10, which is insane. Wow. Yeah, F10 is, is insane. Because you're leaving all of this Aji on the left side of the board, and white isn't even that weak on the outside. So, wow. Okay, but this isn't the point of the lecture, it's just remarking I'm insane. Like, in, in, the, in this game, I'm insane. Oh, oh, and I didn't want to defend the left side. I, I didn't want to defend the left side. So I was reading for a long time, and I was like, oh, this move stops everything. I read it. Um, I mean, to be fair, Grand Slam... Like, <laughs> to be fair, the Grand Slam had very slow time settings. E12 is even more insane, yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. You could tell that I'd only been teach like I'd only taken uh teaching from Jeff for like two months at the at the time. Or like a month and a half. So I was slightly insane, yes, at times. Uh, that has its good parts, but yeah. So actually in this fight we actually misread a sequence where White could kill everything. But what ended up happening was that I sacrificed the corner uh, but I get a lot of strength on the outside where white has a bunch of weak groups. White ended up letting go of, of these guys. And... Uh, oh, I took d18, which is disgustingly bad. Oh god, yeah, yeah, okay, never mind. I mean, ah, okay. So, yeah, it, not important. Not, not the topic of the lecture, but I'm just remembering. Um, like, I basically let white take my base on the on the top side. So, okay. Uh, and here's the maybe the the fun moment in the game. I invaded the top right corner because I thought I was behind, or like yeah, because I thought I needed the cash, and I I put my group my central group on the line, and then uh, ended up living like yeah. This was we still had some time on our clocks in this game, so 
I ended up living that I like. Well, I ended up reading that I can escape with with this attachment, and like somehow my my group escaped, and and I I took White's corner on the top right, which was a huge success. Um, oh, hello there, browser. Yeah, congrats on the win. I mean, I didn't know someone. I didn't know you'd won until uh, someone congratulated you. But uh, I was watching the game before starting the the lecture, so you know, uh, I I guess you would win. Okay, so we reached this position. And the whole idea, so Black's group is still locally dead because this I is false, A and B are me I, and this Y isn't completed, so, you know, Black's quite dead. But White can't really do anything to it, so let's say that White tries to cut, then Black will extend, and then, okay, White can technically cut, but then Black runs out, and then the group at A is much weaker than 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 my uh you know these these stones are actually quite a bit weaker than than my group which is you know poking its head out at A uh so black should be completely fine for the moment um but anyway yeah we we reached this position i i've shoplifted white's corner which was great and uh you know nevertheless i think this is a good moment to stop and evaluate the game and see what's happening and this is like you know just figure out who's better who has more points and also, if you are better, what could go wrong, right? What are the sources of uncertainty? And what are you going to do about them? Um, because so late in the game, when you have a favorable position of differing degrees, you can, you can figure out what could go wrong, right? Um, so let's count it a little bit. So black should have... I count black at around 47 plus the corner. And the reason I say the corner is that we're talking about sources of uncertainty. It's a little bit uncertain whether white will ever invade around D. I like Jeff's expression for these kinds of situations, crush the opponent's dreams. Yeah, yeah, so... Yeah, so... Going back to the lecture I did two weeks ago on playing from behind, on, on winning lost positions, you keep be you keep dreaming big. Yeah, you keep thinking, well, maybe I'll get this big thing, or maybe I'll get this great thing, or what if I uh what if my opponent screws this up? And the idea of playing from ahead is that you look at all of those things, you know, you look at all of those problems that your opponent might want to, you know, think about, and then you, you know and and then you quell them, right? And you know, let's say, let's maybe let white play the next move, r8, which is just a huge move for the right side, and, and then consider white's points. So... So I, I count white at about 52. Remember I said black has 47, plus whatever uh, he makes in the corner. So, you know, if black were, black could quite simply play like this move or something, which isn't a good move. Um, it, it's not a good move, but it's, it, I think this move would be a, a clear way to say that black's better. Uh, and now you, you need to be careful with this type of move because, and, and this will be the subject of the second part of the lecture, maybe. You can't just start playing dame or start playing really small moves in order to crush your opponent's dreams. Like... Usually, you're not so desperately ahead that you can do anything and win, right? And this is the balance, the, the delicate balance you have to strike. You still have to play well with, you know, notwithstanding that you want to make the game safer for you. And that's a, you know, very important um, thing to keep in mind while you play. Um, so... I'd say that in this situation, there's two things black can worry about. And, you know, we've already established that black's probably around 10 points better, you know, um, on, on cash if the, the lower and right, uh, and right side are, are secured. Uh, but, okay, let's talk about some sources, uh, sources of uncertainty. The first one I can think of is, theoretically, you know, these cuts still exist. 
and you know, at some point in the game, it's possible that white will push through here. I mean, this isn't really white sente because, okay, now white cuts, but now black gets this incente, which is a big deal, and also gets this incente, and just makes eyes everywhere and everywhere. So, you know, that, that doesn't worry black, but, you know, let's say that white connects, we still push through. For now, we're fine. The point is, this is uncertain. Like, white has a way to cut this group, and we need to keep that in the back of our heads. Um, and during the game, what I thought was, well, white can't do this yet, so we won't defend it. I think the the reasonable way to do this would be to say, these exchanges aren't even bad, let's just make them. You know, because it might not work now, but it might work later. So I, I think that this would have been the safest way for black to play. And black's next move might actually be here, to be quite honest. Like, it... The two sources of uncertainty that I was discussing were R3 and, and the cut in the middle. Making these exchanges is reasonable, yeah. They're a little bad, but they're not really bad. Like, you're still gonna, you're still gonna get the peep, the peep at C. Um, you're still maybe gonna get to play the peep at D later. Like, white's group isn't super strong. So, probably, if I were playing, I would maybe just exchange one of them. So, you know, you don't need to exchange both, because if once you exchange one of them, then, like we said, white, you know, white can hardly play this. The only way white can cut is to do this, but this is, like, suicide. Like, black's just getting eyes everywhere, and... So, you know, I think the most reasonable thing would probably be to just exchange one of them, so you preserve the possibility to cut here later, and and then defend. And, you know, there's probably a couple of different ways to defend. I might just play here, to be quite honest. Um, or maybe I would jump, because, you know, generally, you still want... You, like, when you're ahead, it's good to play things that reduce uncertainty while still playing a good move. So P6 is a good move. I'll play the bump again. Ah, uh, the bump. The bump, I was considering it. The reason I didn't want to play it uh, so, Auntie's suggestion, I, I was considering it, the reason I don't want to do it is that I'm thinking about this cut later. Like, it looks somewhat juicy. So, if I if I play the bump, then the cut is, like, much less um, usable, let's say. So, that would be my logic behind not exchanging. So, I, I think, yeah, I think the sharper move is to just play P6. Which defends from, you know, if white tries to invade R3 now, in general, black should just be able to kill. It should be fine. And also, white should be very careful because if he gets up to some living activities, then this cutting point could become a real problem. So, you know, white, white has to be careful. This corner is not that big that black can't use the strength for something else. So, in general, this move, I think, has the right idea. You protect the uncertainties while still being a little bit sharp. And what, you know, what I did in the game was greedy, so I attached. And then, and then, uh, and then Lukan, uh, who's also a Nordic Odoja teacher, and uh, um, I guess kind of knew that he can't just answer, right? Because th this attachment, what this attachment is saying is, are you stupid enough? to just do this and like let me win the game, basically. And of course Lucan isn't stupid enough, so he attaches in the corner. And... And... Yeah, oh my god. And then, yeah, here... What I did here was insane. I wasn't even that badly under time pressure. So remember how... Remember how I neglected to make this exchange? That might come back to bite me now, because when white eventually cuts through like this. Um, when white eventually cuts through like this, if white's really, really strong on the lower right, this group's toast. The entire dragon is toast. Um, but I, I, I was like, nah, 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 it's fine, and I played S8. And the reason I played S8 was really funny. I kind of hallucinated that I can live on the, on the top side, which is dumb. So at this point, I should have just probably played here and given up this two stones. 
And Black's probably still better. That's the thing. Black's probably still, you know, doing well. Um, but now it's less clear because I gave something up. Okay. So I was like, no, 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 no. I take the side. You're not getting it, you know? So I, I really didn't know how to play from behind. I gave white all of these center moves. And then white just cut through in the middle. It's hard to compromise, yeah. And admit you're wrong. Yeah, yeah. I mean, at this point, I, I think the moment I played this, the moment I played probably... Um, the moment I played... Probably the moment I played S8, it's too too late. Like, you know, here I should be able to cut and let white, you know, make some co or live in the corner. That should be much better than what I did because... You know, even if white lives in the corner, like, let's say some sequence. At least white isn't strong in the middle. And anymore. Like, white's shape is really thin. And then... Black... I mean, white's even locally dead, so I don't know what the problem was for me. Oh, oh, ah, ah I remember. I remember. Okay, I remember. So, the idea is that white can exchange here. And then... And then play this. I think. Or maybe exchange this first. So, you know, white has some co in the corner. And, you know, this is uncertain because my own group on the outside is a little bit weak. Uh, so maybe white thought that this was a good chance. But this is still what I should have done. Like, what I did was, like, playing right into white killing me. So, yeah, white cut through, and now I'm, I'm just dead everywhere. So, like, this entire, this entire group is, is dead. I just assume I, I'm I'm always wrong, so admitting to, to being wrong is easy. I see. Yeah. Well, when I I think here, you know, the problem is that black has a very very easy natural way to increase certainty. So, you know, it isn't hard to just get this exchange out of the way. This exchange isn't even a bad exchange; it's a normal exchange. But I have sometimes this attitude that I don't want to make exchanges. Uh, which is often, you know, you know, not infrequently just comes back to bite me. That's a bad habit that I've been working on. So, if I just play like this, all the certainty is quelled in two moves, and these moves aren't even bad, and that's the key thing. You have to play moves that make sense anyway, but you always need to keep in mind how your opponent might want to make life hard for you and prevent that from happening. When you're behind... Uh, when you're behind, you have to do the opposite. You have to play moves that look kind of reasonable, but also keep in mind that you have to make your opponent be as uncomfortable as possible. If you're really behind, if you're really, really behind, you you actually have the psychological luxury of just going insane, right? So, the, the you know, people have been memeing the caveman thing I said, like, a couple of weeks ago for a while. So you can go caveman. Likewise, if you're just 30 points ahead... You know, if you're just 30 points ahead, then, you know, in two-point endgame, then you can just pass, you know, or you can just, like, play, you can do anything, right? So, if, if you go, if you go very, like, to the extremes, you can play terribly passive moves and still win. This situation is a tiny bit different because I'm ahead by between Komi and 10 points, but it's not like I can just pass, you know, and win the game. So it's still a little bit delicate, and I should still be accurate about playing the right moves. So, okay. Speaking of being accurate about playing the right moves, the next game, the next two games, deal with the subject of being a little bit too passive while you're ahead. So, you know, something that I've had trouble doing um, when, um, when I've played um, games where I'm ahead. So number one, um, number one is that as a player, until around 2019, I was used to playing from behind. So I was like going caveman on everyone in every second half of the game. So I was, yeah, so that was how I played back then. I was like, uncertainty, I don't know, you don't know either. You know, we, we, do, we, we play roulette on the go board, you know? And I started struggling when I improved in 2019, and I found my, I started finding myself in good positions. I was like, what's this? How am I winning? Like... I'm never winning until move 150, you know? So winning at earlier stages in the game was a very new thing to me. And I had a lot of trouble adjusting how I, how I have uh, 
you know, how I think. And what often happened to me was this kind of thing where I'd still try to play extremely aggressive or I'd try to push for as much as I could anyway because I didn't have a reverse gear. I didn't have a way to, you know, it's not just that I was unable to play passively, it's un I was unable to play reasonably even when I'm better. This is an example of the opposite thing. So, um, okay, this one. Uh, and this is one of, like, the worst games that I've played in the last three years. So this is a, this is a solid example for the topic at hand. So, um, this was, uh, are you describing my games feel like it? Yeah. You were missing the Lucan button. Yes, exactly. And remember how I said that at the end of the lecture, I want to go through a game where someone played from ahead like really, really well and just close up, closed out a game very solidly. Guess who the example person is? Guess who the example person is? It's yeah. Yeah. So, um, uh, now there is such a thing as pushing the Lucan button too hard. Uh, Li Chang Ho, well, the, the European Li Chang Ho, about three stones weaker. So, um, okay, maybe not three. Um, so, yeah, so we'll get to Lu Kan's game later in the game. Uh, later in the game, later in the lecture. But this, this game is, um, I, I played it in the World Amateur Go Championship of 2018. Um, and this was one of my worst tournaments ever, um, approximately. So I lost 25 rating points, being rated 25-25. Being called the European Li Chang Ho is quite a praise. Um, I don't know. Um, uh, I mean, he- the <laughs> stone Lucan. <laughs> yeah, I mean, Lucan's pretty good, what can I say? Like, he's not quite Li Chang Ho-esque in his precision, but the method is to, an ex to a large extent there. Okay, um, and it, he's pretty precise, that's why the last game in the lecture is about him, so, okay. Uh, I was white, and this game was very, very, very suspicious. Very, very suspicious. But we'll leave that aside. It's, I played it nearly three years ago. Um, so we kind of went crazy, he tried to kill me. Um, he, he, he tried to kill me. And he died. That's what happens to four duns that play me. Um, even back then, that's what happened to four duns that played me. Okay, so fine. Okay, so, so this is the result that we finish with. So I killed the entire top right for like these two ponukis, which should be a very favorable result. I mean, this started with me invading here, right? This started with my invasion here. So it's a pretty solid result, in fact. And for some reason, he thought it important to protect 12 points in Gote, um, and okay. Now, let's go a little bit forward, and okay, we're gonna talk about this position, or you know, we could, we could start from here as well. Um, white's very much ahead, so, you know, white, if, if I had to, to guess, you know, black solid points are approximately this. Uh, plus the corner. And that's about it. And the reason is that, you know, when I play such a move at S4 later, uh, you're either going to let me kill these two stones, because right now the only reason that I can't kill the two stones is this cut. So there's actually a lot of Aji there that's going to let me live in the corner later. And of course, black has some influence, but this influence is not worth the huge deficit on territory that um, that black has. So, you know, I'd say white has. I'm gonna count quickly. So, if we count past this line. S4 is so delicious, I want it immediately. I played it pretty soon, Auntie, don't worry. So I'm counting that whereas black has around 30 solid points, white has around 65. If we count, like, without even counting, like, G15. And, you know, counting five extra points here. So white's 
really, really good here. Of course, Black's influence is a little bit stronger than White's influence, but it's my turn, I can reduce it. And you know, I I mean, even my influence is kind of good at... Okay. Um, so we arrive to this point, and uh, you know, White is unusually ahead in this game. So this is the type of game where we can argue, yeah, White can kind of relax here. You know, like, we we can be a little bit less stringent. Like, you know, often you're ahead, but you're not very ahead, so you still have to play accurately. You can chill here a little bit, you know, in theory. Uh, but nevertheless, let's start by considering what are the sources of uncertainty, what could go wrong, and, like, you know, what do we do about it, right? Um, so I can see, broadly speaking, three sources of uncertainty on this board. So one of them is, how big is this going to get? So Black's Moyo here, which I've already done, a, you know, some, uh, I've gone some ways to reducing it with, with K11. Another one is, uh, oh, K12 cut. Oh, that's an interesting one. Um, I, I'd say K12 cut is not really a source of uncertainty yet, because I can kill it, right? So I can even, I can even kill it like this. Like, if, if this happens, then Black is, you know, not doing so well. So, oh wait, actually, let's exchange here first, then play here. And this is theoretically a source of uncertainty, but it's very unlikely that Black survives this. So it's something to keep in the back of our mind. It's not a big deal yet. But yeah, it, it is something, you know, if Black peeps, if Black adds a move somewhere, we should worry about it a little bit. Um, some other sources of uncertainty are, I would say, where is the line drawn on the top side? So where am I getting territory on the top side? Because it's very hard to tell, right? It's very hard, like, is it, you know, is Black going to get a move here and I play here? Is it, you know, am I going to get to play this move? How is it going to work? So that's a source of uncertainty. And another source of uncertainty is, am I going, you know, I'm going to get to play this move, which I actually played in the game. And then, you know, later I'm going to get to make life. So... Broadly speaking, the two sources of uncertainty are my center and his center. And I would say that if we look at the solid points, white's clearly better on solid points. And therefore, it would kind of, it, you know, it would somewhat behoove me to focus on his moyo because, you know, his is, you know, his is. First of all, potentially bigger, right? Mine is like, yeah, you know, I don't know. Like, what do I play? I play something like, something like this, perhaps? Oh, wait, oh, okay. Something like this. And I just keep a little bit of extra, whereas Black's theoretically has a chance to become very big. So, you know, the maximum potential of this Moyo is like this. And then the, then I don't invade, which I can invade, but, you know, I'm ahead. I don't want to invade. Um, So... In my mind, you want to reduce uncertainty while still playing a big move. What are some candidates for that? What are some obvious big moves that you think help reduce uncertainty? Help, in, in this case, help limit Black's influence. Uh, and if, to me, there are a few candidates you could consider. I don't know what chat will come up with. Um, to me, I would probably consider something like this shoulder hit, maybe something like this pincer. I think this shoulder hit looks good. Um, in retrospect, you know, like, um, I had actually Jeff in, in our first lesson ever, uh, Jeff uh, showed me this game and suggested h3. I probably would shoulder hit. So the idea of the shoulder hit is that, you know, if something like this happens, then Black, you know, you can still live in here, so Black's territory is very limited, and, you know, after White plays some move that makes sure that the group isn't, isn't dying, then how does Black make 60, uh, how does Black make 70 points here? It's, like, physically impossible. And, you know, this is just a very big, solid reduction, and a big move, right? So, just if you look at it from the perspective of go fundamentals, the lower side is the only open side. And you want to limit the Moyo a little bit. So, you know, you might want to play 
you might want to play the pincer. And, you know, that's possible. And, and then, like, shoulder hit and create a group. That's fine. And, you know, you have some ambitions of connecting on the second line later. The reason I'm not such a fan of H3 in retrospect is that Black theoretically can, you know, sack the one stone to build the wall. But this wall is actually... Uh, this is perfect. Like, uh, White's winning so bad... Like, White's winning so hard that it's not like... It's impossible to lose this because White just plays here, here, here. Black's influence is theoretically a little bit something, but, you know... After White attaches here or something, it's going to be sufficiently reduced. Like, this central profit... Uh, the central profit is, you know, very much limited by the stone at K11. And this is one of the things about the center, right? The center isn't really big, right? Or it is big, but another move rarely affects the center status as much as you think it does. What about a silly move like H11 or is it too easy going? H11, so if we go to H11, H11 is just not doing that much. So you're still leaving a hole in your own wall, and you're, you are limiting Black's potential. Like, it wins. Everything wins. Um, but it's probably not accurate. Like, this random center move shouldn't be bigger than a move that follows, you know, Go Fundamentals a little bit more soundly. Because, you know, we've been taught that this move doesn't really do anything for territory, it doesn't do anything for group strength either because your groups are already strong. So you might as well just play on the side of the board and deal with your opponent's influence. Um, looking at E10, question mark. Um, well, I mean, E10, E10, E10 might be the best move in terms of just crushing your opponent, but we're not interested in that. We might be because it is a safe attack. Like you could do it, but yeah. Anyway, I think it's about time to look at my move. I played G I played F13. And I think, you know, maybe in October or so, I had a series of lessons with Browser, who's in the chat, dealing with this kind of move. About how, you know, the center doesn't matter, and like the, the difference between white playing the next move and black playing the next move isn't very big, and... When I was, so during this game, I didn't listen to my own advice. I mean, at the time, I didn't have my own advice because I was much worse. But I just played F13. And the idea of F13 is, oh, I close this territory. Even, you know, what I was doing was I counted this for black. And I'm like, even if black gets all of this, black isn't winning yet. So I was like, oh, I'll just close my, my territory. And I have a point. Like, I'm still winning, it's just such a small move compared to playing on the lower side of the board that it's kind of just weird. Like, it, it's not, you know, the uncertainty of how big this uh, Moyo is going to get is actually very small. If Black plays something like this and I defend, or if I play a move like this, the difference is like 10 points at most. It's like these 10 guys. And it's not reducing uncertainty that much. Yeah, but Black can still, like, try stuff. So the move is just weird. Like, it doesn't do much. And you'll see that... I'm... Like, I do my very, very best to just close the board down and do nothing. And, like, let my opponent get as much as possible. So, yeah, I connected. Then Black played um, F5. And then at this point, I could invade... And I might even six. I think I would succeed in invading. But okay, in the game, I just reduce, reduce, reduce. Like, and, and we get to this position. Um, oh, hello there, Apollo. Go. Um, so, in just a few moves, I gave Black. So I, for myself, got approximately ten extra points, and this Ponuki, which doesn't matter, and I gave Black. You know. approximately 30 points he didn't deserve. So now the game's close. And I I'm actually still better, but I messed up the end game and, and ended up losing by by um, uh, by half a point. Uh, now, there's an interesting story behind this. I actually, uh, we counted 
I won the game by half a point, according to our counting, then the guy recorded his game until the end of the game, like, until end game, And then his, like, score estimator said that he was winning by half a point. So then he, he went to the organizers, he was like, I won by half a point. And then the, the, the organizers went to me, and they were like, uh, like, this was actually Michael Redmond, who was the referee at the, at, like, at the event, and he was like, um, well, you know, how about we replay the game and we see? And then the the result was like, it, you know, we, we counted again, and I lost by half a point. And they were like, well, we can't annul the result once it's already been agreed to, so it's up to you. Um, this last round of the tournament also. And I was like, yeah, fine. So I lost the game. And actually, I got, I got a... Uh, but actually, I got a, the Fair Play Award, and I got these, like, really nice uh, Japanese ghost stones for it. So, you know, there's goods and bads. Um... So this ga this game this game got me this game got me a nice uh, set of stones which was you know they, they, it was nice of them. Um, okay. Um, yeah this this game this game was um, <laughs> if I let my opponent win I get nice stones yeah. Plus Redmond got to see your horrible play ah don't tell me about that Jesus. I mean, me seeing my horrible play is, is like, terrible. Um, okay. But yeah, the main thing in this game is that there is such a thing as playing too passively here. And, like, when you're ahead, you can play, you know, you don't need to go crazy, but you can still play things that you think are reasonable. You can still play things that you think are big. Like, you know, something, something I used to do, I, I used to do this thing that's very, like, BM. So, um, when I was studying in China, um, you know how they, we counted with Chinese rules, so we did area scoring. And at some point, I counted how many points I had, and then I figured out, if I don't lose any points, and I put 30 more stones on the board, even if they make zero points, I'll win. You know? So, um... So I, I'd, like, count out 30 stones, I'd close my bowl, and I'd put them in front of me, you know? And then, like, I knew that if I get those 30 stones down without losing any of the points I counted, I'd win, according to Chinese counting. It doesn't even matter what's on the board anymore, it's just, like, I get these these 30 stones down and I win. Um, and, yeah, so I, I'm not sure what my opponents thought about that. Um... <laughs> And, but the point is that that's a terrible, terrible habit, because if you're just like, oh, I want to win by the bare minimum playing as passively as I can, I, I don't care if they're all dummy, then sometimes you don't win, right? Like, in this case, I took a game where I'm probably ahead by about 20 points. Like, this game should end in a plus 20 for white or so, at least. Like, this game's terrible for black. And I ended up losing it by half a point, so, you know, happens. Um, and, yeah, just... Keep in mind that even when you're very much ahead, you still have to keep, you know, while keeping in mind the uncertainties on the board and what scares you and what you don't want to happen, it's really important to make sure that you're still playing at a certain base level, like that your moves still make sense, because otherwise you're just going to fall behind again, like you can't play nothing, you know, um, and that's actually a problem I had, so when I played weaker opponents, uh, so when I was like five, uh, five done or, um, yeah, yeah, a, a weak to five, uh, weak to strong five done when I'd play three and four duns and I'd get a good position sometimes, I'd be like, what do I do now? Because I don't like understand, like, so I'd either mess up the board way too much or I'd play too passively and almost lose. So yeah, I lost to a lot of weaker players when I was five done. Okay. So this, I actually had saved an example, um, for... I saved another example of how playing too passively in um, while ahead can lose you a game, and this is actually the only game, the only win of mine uh, against uh, like in in this whole lecture. It's a game against Andre Kravitz that I played very recently in the Grand Prix finale. But unfortunately, we're already seventy minutes into the lecture, so the more important game to show is you know I've already shown how not dealing with uncertainty correctly can be a problem and how dealing with certainty in too much of a 
dealing with uncertainty in too much of a passive way and not caring about actually playing good moves can be a problem. More than showing another example, I think it's important to show someone who actually is good at this. So, um, I struggle slowing down now because Jeff said every slow move makes the game closer and then a small mistake can end it. I can't shake that idea. Well, yeah, the point is, usually, usually in Go, the right move could be risky, but the second best or the third best move doesn't have to be risky. So you can, you can play moves that are fine that still increase certainty and make the game less risky, right? You just shouldn't pick the 10th best move because theoretically that's the one that, you know, creates the least uncertainty. So this is a balance you need to find. And, you know, probably the best player that I know at handling this kind of balance is Lukas Podpera, who is also a Nordic Dojo teacher. And we're going to look through a game that he played against me uh, from the recent Corona Cup, the, the October Corona Cup from last year. So um, I'm, I'm black, I think. Yeah, I'm black. Oh, B-Cruel B B -cruel, B -cruel won their game. Yeah. Um, well, you're just in time for the end of the lecture. That was a long game. Wow. Um, so, yeah, this game... Uh, so, since you just joined, this is like the last game uh, I wanted to show for the lecture. And the idea is, this is a game where White, Lucas Potpera, handled the... handled being ahead very well. So, just did a very solid job. So, okay, we, we'll go through the game. You know, the game itself was... I was probably a bit better, I thought, for most of it, but only a bit better. So I liked my position. Um, eventually I messed up, as I'm wont to do. You managed to burn your entire clocks. Yeah, I, b apparently be cruel and their opponent did. Um, that happens... At, when was the last time I played a tournament game and didn't get into Bioyomi? Or like didn't get under time pressure? Oh, actually, I did play a practice game a couple of days ago, which lasted only 80 moves. But it lasted 80 moves, and I wasted 55 of my 60 minutes, so... <laughs> yeah. Okay. I think the last time for me was like 2013 or something like that. I've been a slow player for a long time. I was getting into Bioyomi since I was like 12 or so. So... Yeah. Okay. Anyway, this game, I messed up, so I... You know, what happened was that instead of reducing the lower side, I chose to live in a very small way. I'm black, right? I chose to live in a very small way and then lived in Gote instead of finding Sente life. And this leads to a very humorous position where, um, interestingly, how many groups do you think black has? There, there's more than you think there are. Um, yeah, this is, this is a funny game in that sense. Um, it's even funnier when you realize how many groups white has. Um, so... And then you wonder who won. So, yeah. Anyway. In this position, white should undoubtedly be better. And the reason is... Uh, seven group... Wait, se seven? I count six. Wait. So I count... One, two, three, four, five, six. Um, I mean, it's gonna become seven very soon, Garden, don't worry. Um, <laughs> yeah. So, I think a quick count, S13 might become, maybe, yeah. No, not really. I, I mean, it's like, white just dies, so black should be okay. But don't worry, I'll make another group. Fear not. Um, I, I'd say white has about seven points on the lower right. And about maybe like up to 10 points on the top side. So white has about, you know, 25 points, including Komi, which doesn't look like much, right? So let's count Black's territory for a second. So I have more points. So I have 42 points. So I'm, I'm ahead, you know, roughly 15 points. But white has two advantages. It's white's turn. Um, this group isn't yet alive, and white has 
this, all of this influence that I have to answer to. So, you know, white, you know, white, white plays, if white plays this move, white's already better on points. Um, if, I think if you stick this on a computer, white's about 10 points up. So, yeah, that, it's a good game for white. But okay, in this situation, oh, I know this game. Yeah, some of you might have watched it live because it was, you know, played, I think, uh, last October. Uh, or maybe early November. So, so the question I'd ask to the audience is, what is uncertain here for white? Like, what are you unsure of? What are you scared of? And how, how do you want to deal with it? Keeping in mind that you want to play well, if you possibly can. Um, because to me, it's a very specific thing. So white's behind on points, white's ahead on influence. And the thing with influence is that, you know, influence is somewhat of a certain variable because you know it will become something. Like, you can't, you can't look at this monster, you know, moyo that I marked for white and say that white's not getting any profit from it. I want some territory in the middle left, says Battle Porridge. Yeah, yeah. So I guess you're saying that you would like for this influence to become territory. Like, you don't want it to just be influence, you want it to be something certain. So, yeah, 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 that's a perfectly good point. So, you know, if if black plays if black plays something like um, you know, oh wait, let, let's pass for white. And oh, no, let's pass for white. Okay. And black plays something like this and suddenly you're you're it's very uncertain how many points your moyo is going to get you because it's open everywhere. It's like so you know, the type of move that white may be considering here is playing f10. And, you know, I know that last game, I just said that the center doesn't matter, and that, you know, it doesn't matter how many moves you add here, like, or like, even if you add a move, it often doesn't make that much of a difference. That's a general rule to which there are exceptions. And if we look at this center, it will be enclosed, with one move. Exactly. This is this is something I tell my students all the time. If you close it with one move, it's big. And also if you close such a monster with one move, it's big. So what Lucan did was actually a Q, Q6, which is an attacking move, in effect. And um, Q6, uh, he, he played F10 very shortly, but Q, you know, Q6 is fine to start with. Keep in mind that my own the group here is in a little bit of trouble. I actually ignored him, I think, because I didn't want to get... Yeah, so I ignored him because let's say that I defend. White's just going to play here next and play on the right side and then make this, this territory. And then white doesn't care about the center. White has enough anyway. Like, white needs five points in the middle to be easily ahead. So that's something I also need to consider that white... You know, here I think Lucan actually had the right perception when he started with Q6. Because Q6 is a big move. Let's say that Lucan plays at F F10, which is a move that, you know, he played soon that is big. I play R6 and sort of enclose his group. If Lucan tries to get out, then I actually fight him for it. And if, you know, I can enclose in this type of way. And, you know, then I get control of the right side. My group is fine. It's a very big move. So Lucan, of course, wants to play F10 because he knows that that's the move that increases certainty the most. But he has the right perception in that this move is really big. So, you know, there's that balance between playing the right move and playing the safe move that Lucan is actually very good at. That's why you need to find the moment just before the opponent can close with one move in the middle slash reduce. Yeah, so ideally Black would like to play this, but the right side is huge and my group is weak. So I have too many things to worry about before I play F10. So what happened was that I, I played R11, which was huge. Also, and my reasoning for this from the perspective of the person who's behind is that I want to keep uncertainty on the board, even if Lucan does play this move very soon and just tries to enclose with F10, then I can still theoretically reduce it somewhat. And that's going to be very difficult because I'm weak, right? The, gr the group at C is very weak. Not very, but somewhat weak. So I have to be very careful. But I'm behind, so I have to, I have to hope for something. So I was like, okay... F10 reduces certainty, it doesn't remove it. Hence, I played R11. And uh, Lucan plays M4, 
I lived. So I'm actually alive now because, you know, I just make eyes. But with the next move, Lucan basically ensures that the territory behind this line is very likely to be his, because if I stick a move here, it's just going to die, right? Like not, not like this, like this. So, and very likely a lot more of it's going to become point. So even though there is a degree of uncertainty, the uncertainty is greatly, greatly reduced. Now, if you asked me which move is bigger, R9 and F10, I'm not sure. I think R9 might be bigger, but at this point, they're close enough that Lucan can permit himself the luxury of just playing the bigger move. Sorry, just playing the safer move, regardless of which one is bigger. So, okay. Here I went crazy. Very soon I went crazy. Oh, I peeped, uh, hoping he wouldn't uh, connect. And probably connecting isn't necessary. I think probably what white should do is, you know, play something like this, and then, you know, I'm never going to cut because my my stones are going to die. I mean, they're, they're not happy. Um, I'm in more trouble than white is, for sure. So... But Lucan connected, which is maybe a little bit too safe, but it doesn't change the positions, and he's much better, so I understand that. And, okay, here's when I went insane. So I played uh, L7. And, um, yeah, L7 is... L7 is asking to be killed, I suppose. Um, because, you know, White's gonna play this move next, which he did. And... You know, this is this was basically the most that I thought I could push for without certainly dying. Um, but the way Lucan handled this was very nice. Now, you could play something like J7 and just close and just increase certainty. You could. But it's not correct. And it's very safe to attack this because it's not like I'm going to go deeper. It's not like I'm going to go deeper. This will, this will just die. So I have to basically be protective and run. And... Therefore, white risks nothing by being a little bit severe against my stones. So, yeah, so white's, make, white's actually doing a good job of attacking my stones while making sure that he keeps enough territory. And actually, uh, very soon in the game, it's not easy to sacrifice your baby. <laughs> Wait, is it, didn't Jeff say that once? Um, okay. Um, so... Notice here that what Lucan ended up doing was, so p7 jump, he never played here. And the reason he never played here is that it's not very big. Like, he never played uh, J, J7 defensively because even if I, you know, even now, if I enter the, the center, white's still going to keep attacking my group. So now it's something along the lines of um, potentially this this type of, 09, which takes my eye shape, uh, and you know maybe White can even play something like this, which is like, oh, are you really going to remove all your eye space and then let me play this and just kill you? So the point is that Lucan was actually still being somewhat accurate, right? He's still keeping in mind that he has to attack this group while not risking much. So oh, hello there. Oh, Baduk Bum and Cat Gaming. Hello there, everyone, and, and Mayonat also. The crowd increases. Uh, and uh, we're reaching the end of the lecture, unfortunately, but glad you joined. Um, so White actually had a very flexible mindset here where he was willing to give away some of the, some of the center for pressure on my group. And the idea was that, okay, eventually I ended up playing Q12, which is a, you know, a relatively small move. It's meant to prevent White from eventually um, you know, connecting and getting some sente moves. I mean, okay, in, in this case, I'll, I'll be... In this case, I would probably be fine, but it's just worse on territory. So, like, you know, after this, I'm I'm risking giving white this type of endgame, which is really big. So, you know, my move is the best way to defend the group safely. Uh, but at this point, I think Lucan... Uh, oh, Lucan connected here and sente, and now he just plays R9. Um, oh, um, so R9 is again a nice move because keep in mind that after Black played here, Lucan's mindset was much better than just I play here. Because if he had played here, 
and I had played uh, R8 after white just defends, then I've actually gotten a big reduction and it's just big profit. Uh, and maybe white's still better, but Lucan was very precise about keeping the group under pressure and being flexible about giving up the center or like letting me reduce the center, which is different. Because, you know, after I play something like this, uh, Hane, white's still going to keep... White's still going to keep well over, well over, you know, 10 points in the area. So Lucan was willing to put up with a little bit of uncertainty to play correctly. And he gets rewarded by it by eventually getting these moves, which, and you know, and just securing the right side. And this was just a very nice way where I thought he balanced putting pressure on my group with playing safely very nicely. Um, and actually, he finished the game with a very nice finishing blow, which was... Okay, so here, yeah. Um, I kept kind of poking, like, do you want to defend here, maybe? And, and he was like, no. No, I'm not defending here. And, and he actually went for something even more. So, Lucan is very easily ahead, you know, like, here. If he plays here. If he plays here, he's, you know, easily ahead. Like, at this point, he's leading by Komi, whatever he does. But my point is that he's still willing to go a little bit further, especially if he thinks it doesn't incur any risk. I mean, after all, if he tries to cut my stones with, you know, something like um, 011, which he did in the game, it's not like he's taking a risk. So at this point, even though White played aggressively and I ended up dying with this group, I think I resigned very shortly afterwards. Yeah, yeah, White connected here and I resigned. Um, so if I connect, white connects, and I'm cut, and I don't have a way to make eyes. So, you know, white was almost... White was very... White was acutely aware of that he still... He still has the right to use his thickness to be aggressive. So that strikes a contrast to how I played in, in the previous game that we were looking at. Uh, <laughs> deaths in this kind of situation just occur natu naturally, ask any Fox player. I mean, the point is, I was trying to grab for as much as I could because the position was desperate, but yeah. So if we go back to my game um, from the WATC, remember how I played this move, which was very passive, just keep my points, use my influence to get 10 extra points when there are much bigger moves on the board. What I should have done in accordance with Lucan's logic is probably to just play here, and if black plays here, play here. And be like, well, I know I'm ahead on points, but I also know I'm ahead on influence, and I know that I objectively have the right to use this influence to make your life miserable. You know, and that that's a powerful thing if we consider that, you know, Often when people are ahead, they're just like, close everything, close everything, close everything. And Lucan has that reputation of the, the player who just closes the door. Oh, wait, this is the wrong game. Okay. Lucan has that reputation of the player who just closes the door on, um, on any kind of complicated situation and is just ahead and does nothing. But I still thought that in this situation, in this game, even though he's willing to play something like F10 and be safe, he's still willing to do the right thing if I go this far. You know, like if I go this far, he's going to punish me for it. And he did. So I just thought that this game showed that Lucan has actually quite a healthy mindset towards playing from ahead um, and or, or also to playing situations where he's slightly ahead. So Lucan's very good at, you know, Lucan's very good at being a little bit better because he knows how to keep the balance between being ahead by a little bit and not risking being ahead of uh, being behind ever. So, you know, it, it's like, it's, uh, he often has this type of win where either he just wins by a few points or his opponent overplays and eventually he does punish. So if you go, if you step too far. Now, if I had to say, you know, I, in my opinion, Lucan's still a little bit too conservative in a lot of his game and could go further. But this game's not an example of one of them, and he very often does a great job. So, you know, if, you know, I was thinking, if we're going to show an example of someone playing from ahead the correct way, Lucan has to be the person. You know, he's very good in Europe at this. It's like being a good musician, it has to seem effortless. Well, effortless is a little bit too much, but yeah. Um, anyway.
In conclusion, I really need to avoid this type of position against Lucan where it's just an endgame. Um, <laughs> like, this type of game, this type of game, um, not this one, this one is much better. Where, like, everything's dying and we're sacrificing groups. That's better for me. Um, but yeah, anyway, that's a side note. But yeah, that's probably uh, what I'd prepare for this. I'd actually prefer pre 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 prepared more, but uh, you know, it's uh, time for the lecture to end and time for me to eat and stuff like that. Um, but yeah, I I hope this was helpful. Um, I it was meant to be a little bit of a look at the flip side of uh, winning. Um, oh well, uh, the flip side of winning lost positions, just winning good positions. It's just same kind of position, but what are you? looking at from the perspective of the person who's ahead yeah yeah thank you thank you everyone for watching i hope that was uh, helpful and stuff check out the ngd youtube channel if you want to watch some of the vods um all the last three of the lectures one by me like two by me the last two and also one by matthias have um um are on the subject of uncertainty and are kind of related if you're interested and also uh i don't know if you're interested check out the ngd website those of you who aren't students and uh, yeah, that's about all I'll mention. And thanks so much for watching. And I don't know, there will be an NTD lecture in two weeks. Again, probably not by me, probably by someone else. Um, and yeah, that's that's a, that's about it if you want to stay tuned. Um, yeah, what else can I say? Thank you very much for watching and hopefully see you, uh, see you in the next couple of weeks. Bye.